54-year-old male electrician, shoulder pain impingement in the right shoulder, right hand dominant, complains of pain in the lateral humeral region when asked to point to where the region of discomfort, complains of difficulty sleeping, and reports the pain at night is 8 out of 10, which is causing him to wake up. So that's pretty significant, right? Um, his pain during the day is also significant, 6 out of 10. Upon evaluation, patient demonstrates full passive range of motion to the shoulder with pain at the end range and 94 degrees of active inflection, 73 AB, 23 ER, and 42 IR. And his wife says his shoulder bone sticks out when she sees him take off his shirt. What do you guys think? What are you going to assess? Well, we already know we assessed active and passive range of motion, motion and, and pain. And pain. Posture. <clears throat> Posture. And I'm just pretty much going to observe them too with um, during initial evaluation and see. So we're going to check out the shoulder, mm -hmm. um, see what his posture mm -hmm. like, yeah, and observe it. for asymmetry. Yes. Um, what else are you going to evaluate? I would want to check grip strength. Yeah. Can we show Al? Allison, you want to show your shoulders? I can show my shoulders. This is the perfect segue into Allison. Can you take your jacket off? Yeah. So after class last week, Allison was saying something about her shoulders having problems. So. So we'll look. At okay. So look at her in. Standing, right? Do we have any asymmetry? Yeah. Elevated here. What about protracted? Is she protracted or retracted? Not so much. I don't see so much. No? Uh uh. But she's elevated. Now I'm going to say, I want you to move your arms slowly up and down, and we're going to watch. All right, get ready. <laughs> So watch, she's upwardly rotating. She comes back down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, trying to watch it in the mirror last week. And I was like, yeah, you can't see it in the mirror. Okay, show her again. Go on. And I actually have people do it like five times. Yeah, keep going. Do you guys see it? Oh, it's getting worse. Keep going. Does it hurt? Yeah. Uh, no, it hurt last week after doing it a bunch of you guys. Okay, so let's do this last time. <laughs> do you see, every time she does it, it's worsening and worsening and worsening, right? Yeah. What do we think? Look at it. I can cup it, right? It worsens without the like that. Yeah. You can even see, like, near the top. You could even see it has a, yeah, right there. It, it does. Roll. Yeah, yeah. So I'd also want to check her pecs, right? Mm -hmm. To look for pec tightness, because she might be tight pecs both sides. Which, so she has asymmetry, but she's got problems in both sides. But now look at her. So she looked pretty good standing before, yeah. right? <laughs> then we had her do range of motion. And now look at her. Right? Because she's so weak, now she's dying. She's statically winging. This is scapular winging. See? So in this case, his bone sticks out when she take, he takes off his shirt. I'm going to worry about scapular winging. So in an orthopedic patient, because she hasn't had any that we know of, any neurological dysfunction, right? Like a stroke or... Um, traumatic brain injury, right? What would we say would be the muscle that would be the culprit with scapular winging? Subscapular serratus anterior. Serratus anterior with orthopedic situations. So I want to assess this guy's serratus anterior strength, and I want to look what he's moving. Now I'm just going to have her do it one time. Does anyone have anything else heavy? Yours is open and mine's not. Oh, okay. And yours is cold, mine is warm. Um, so let's put the, let's, oh, okay. we'll put this here. Yours is still, they're about the same weight. And hold this out, and now let's watch her. So we weighted her. So go up, and then back down. And it, sh it should worsen. I mean, these aren't too heavy, you know. 
it should worsen when you weighed it. So even if you evaluated someone and it wasn't this glaring as winging, you thought maybe it's winging a little bit, weighed it, put a couple pounds in her hand, and have her do it again, and then see if you can create it. Because there's not much we do in our life other than maybe cheerleading or aerobics where we're not holding on to something, right? Everything else, we, you know, we're doing something with function, so we're weeding our arms. So um, it may not show without holding something. Do you recommend her not to stand like that? She's stretching out. Yeah. I mean, it looks worse when she stands like that. It does look worse. It doesn't matter. The problem is that she needs to strengthen her scapular stabilization muscles, right? And if I were to just check her real quick, remember how we assess? Can you put your arm on the edge of the table? So this one was worse, yeah, which you can't see very well. But um, I'm going to have her do a bucket lift. Hold it up okay, there. Okay, ready, you guys. It's actually not too bad, okay? Mid trap is going to be bad. Yeah, she's she's winging <laughs> when I so even mean a muscle tester. And now, low trap. <laughs> that was sad. Sad. So we need to get her a home program pronto, or when she has a level two student, she's going to be coming back here for therapy. She's going to have a partial tear of rotator cuff because her scapulas are not stable for overhead reach. Would you like compare that to her other side to see like her normal? Because like how do you know she doesn't like, have a normal? She's not stronger. <laughs> like you think you're not you? <laughs> okay, so, like, you come up here. Come up here. You're not winging. Come up here. I'm just saying, like, what if your patient like is a nice I know. Son, how do you know? And, and you're gonna think about that. You're evaluating someone who's 83 yeah. versus someone who's how old are you? 25. Would you expect her to have normal strength? Yeah. 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 But well, I mean, it's still, like, some people are Let's hold this up. Hold this up. Hold this up. Okay, you ready? Hold it up. Can I break her? How old are you? 23. And you're smaller than you're, I could probably take you easier, right? I couldn't break you. <laughs> right? I don't want to do it again to poor Allison, but I could have done it with a finger. Okay. Well, I don't know how you're I can lift babies, though. Yeah. <laughs> They're all right here. Yeah. With your internal rotators and your AD ductures, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, go sit down. But we saw that yesterday, and this is a good opportunity to show that. Okay, so what else are you guys going to assess with this guy? Besides his um, serratus, you might want to um, weight his shoulder when he's moving to check for sure winging, right? And then, so what about treatment? that out we weren't really quite sure so we know he has impingement right and we we suspect that his serratus is weak how would we strengthen the serratus anterior do we know how to do that punch-ups punch-ups but if you, if you don't know there's like a million ways to strengthen the serratus anterior but just lying in supine and having you punch up to the ceiling in this way will strengthen the serratus anterior we want to strengthen the serratus anterior for sure. We know he has impingement. When people have impingement, what is the root typically? Weak external rotators. Does the nerve have anything to do with impingement? Weak, weakness of the external rotators. Weakness of external rotators. And what did you say? Postural asymmetry, right? So we want to improve his posture, strengthen. Because um, what do we think is the future for poor Allison? Um, we'll be seeing her in the clinic. We'll be seeing her in the clinic. We'll wait till she's about 35. She's going to have a rotator cuff tear. My mom just got hers repaired like a month ago. My dad had his a year ago. Oh, yeah. So someone should get Allison a home program, right? Um, so we're going to strengthen the scapular stabilization muscles. Look at the posture. Strengthen serratus, check pecs, because what's, what's weak, the opposite's tight, right? How do we stretch pecs? I like to stretch my pecs down door. Like, yeah, you can do a door jam oh, no. like this. This is the easiest way, then here, then here, right? You can do it in a corner. You can have them lie supine, put a towel hold on their back, push from anterior in the clinic. 
You can have them lie just on a towel roll on the floor at home to stretch pens. How do we strengthen scapular stabilization muscles? How do we strengthen, anyone know? My clinic people all know. So I want to do external rotation. How do I strengthen my external rotators? Like that or like that. Is this, which way should I start? This way or this way? Yeah. This way. Instable, yeah. right? Higher level, yeah. easier, right? Um, so how will I, well, like, is this strengthening my external rotators? Maybe a little in the beginning. So sometimes it's like with my rotator cuff people tears, I call it a tennis swing. Just practice like you're swinging a tennis racket. Just to get started, right? Do you suggest that slight rotation in the torso so that that? No, I want external rotation. Like, I mean, like this? Not that much. Yeah, no, I want external okay. rotation. I could put them in sideline and make it against gravity, right? I could add a weight. I could do isometrics. I could do TheraBand. I could hold a can of peas. You just want to strengthen external rotation. Do you guys, do you remember anything from Anna from clinic about strengthening the scapular stabilization muscles? I don't know if you had any shoulder patients. Chicken wing. Chicken wing is one way to strengthen low trap. And anytime you're reaching overhead, you're strengthening low trap. So chicken wing, did we go over this in class already? No. Because I teach two sections, and I don't remember what I said in one and what I didn't put together. So holding here, okay, here, and the first way to do it is to palm down and lift the elbow. Chicken wing, okay? To make it harder, put the thumb up. Do it. <coughs> okay? To make it harder again, lift the elbow, lift the hand, drop the, el the hand, drop the elbow. And it would be interesting to watch our friend here try to do that exercise. It would be interesting. <laughs> Chicken wing. And then wall slide. Anytime you reach Overhead, this is a closed chain exercise, but it's a way to strengthen low trap. Wall slide. So you can advance it by doing this. Okay? Rhythmic stabilization exercises. The options are endless, right? There's a million ways to strengthen everything. Making circles. Lots of different things. Um, what about sleep? Do you have any ideas for sleep for your guy? He has impingement yeah. syndrome. He's waking up at night. We would like to decrease pain so he can sleep through the night because how are we when we don't sleep? Yeah. Not good, right? So that's a critical thing that you want to give him something day one so that he can sleep better. Do you guys have any ideas? So you might want to know what position he's sleeping in, but what would be the ideal position? Would you put a pillow underneath Put a head? pillow under, because remember that when they repair the rotator cuff for the supraspinatus, they put a pillow under it to put the shoulder at a slack, right? Same thing, have him put a little pillow underneath, put the slack on the supraspinatus, usually your patients can sleep through the night, and they will love you. Right? Because when you can't sleep, you're miserable. Okay, we gotta move on because it's almost 11 and we have a lot to do. Um, let's say the back group. 78 year old female lives alone, mid shaft humeral fracture, um, dominant side, she's in a sling for four weeks. Now is allowed active and passive motion three times a week for six weeks. She cannot sleep at night. She's currently sleeping in a recliner. A, a lot of shoulder patients cannot sleep at night in their bed. Um, limitations in all aspects of, AD, of ADL and is frustrated with pain. She also reports that she has weakness when trying to eat with a fork and brush her teeth. 
What are we thinking, guys? We're going to do a range of motion assessment, just active range of motion. So we're going to assess active range of motion. Check the radial nerve with wrist extension, MP extension, MMT. Check the radial nerve. Task analysis. Do you think she's going to have radial nerve pathology? 20% chance. She says she has trouble eating with a fork and brushing her teeth. Should she have that with a humeral shaft fracture? No. With just the fracture? Because no. I can brush my teeth without even hardly moving my shoulder. No. Right? So she look at you need for that motion though. Right? right? Wrist extension. So absolutely. Check the radial nerve. Um, what else? We're going to do, would you do passive range of motion assessment? No. You have orders for passive and active range of motion. Yeah, assess passive too, because you want to know how she's doing. Scapula movement. Sca get scapula, we get the scapula moving. What else you want to do? What if you know that she has radial nerve pathology and she can't extend her wrist fully? Splint it. What if she doesn't have good MP extension either? <laughs> How are we going to outrigger? Outrigger. She needs an outrigger with the wrist cock up. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good, good. And patients for sleep with this problem, you know, it's just hard. To, you just got to work with people to try to find a way. Sometimes people sleep on the side. So teaching them even to protract the scapula and sleep back here instead of on the side can help. <coughs> even if they put a pillow behind them so they're kind of rolled back on their side, sometimes will help. If they have to sleep on, some people are like, I have to sleep on that side. I can't sleep on the other side, you know? Um, okay. Number three, you guys in the back, 45-year-old female, works as a hairstylist, comes to the clinic with a script from her family doc with shoulder pain, a valentrate. Um, she has gotten progressively worse, limits in her ability to fasten her bra, tuck in her shirt, and perform overhead tasks. She has limitations with active motion in the shoulder, but presents with full passive. What are we thinking? It's a strength problem. It's a strength yeah, problem. It's issues with external rotation and overhead issues. Right, so what are we thinking? It's yeah. likely. Rotator cuff. Rotator cuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. And look at what she does all day, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, holds blow dryer. And here's a way, the way that we assess for rotator cuff pathology, one way, there's a million tests. You can get any shoulder book and you'll see a whole grocery list of assessments you can test for different pathology. We would have needed three more days to go over it all. Empty can test. Will that, will that empty if I turn it over? No. Like emptying a can, right? And then raising up will create significant pain if it's impingement or rotator cuff pathology. That's one of the things that we do. So like you described, blow drying hair, right? All kinds of that. Or even cutting. All right, 45-year-old, oh no, 63-year-old female who's retired, active with her grandchildren. She presents to the clinic with a script for therapy three times per week for four weeks, frozen shoulder. She um, indicates the doctor told her she does not go, does, the therapy does not work, she'll have to have manipulation. She demonstrates limitations in both active and passive during the eval. Pain, 10 out of 10. And patient is guarding with motion and apprehensive to try therapy. So do you think she's going to be a great, easy patient? No. 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 So what do you think we should start with? So we're going to eval, we've already evaled active and passive. Or not, what does it say here? But we know we would eval active and passive. Sometimes when patients are really guarding, their active might be better than their passive because they're not letting you take their arm, mm -hmm. right? Um, what else do we want to eval? We want to look at posture, asymmetry, stability. What else? Do I want to do manual muscle tests on her, do you think? Will she come back if you do manual no. muscle tests? No. She has a pain of 10 out of 10. If you do manual muscle tests on her, she's not coming back. 
She's not coming back. You just lost a patient. So I thought I talked about this in class last week, but I didn't. So one thing you can do if your patient is guarding, if I try to do passive range of motion with her, it's going to be tug of war. She's going to be in pain. She's not coming back. So if a patient is guarding, you have to give the control to the patient, okay? So you have to find some way to get them to move their shoulder. And I don't have anything good here. Um, you have to find a surface that's just the right height. So if I take this, oh, there's some ADL equipment in here. I don't think that's supposed to go in here. Here's the enlarged handled spoon and a, a highlighter, a bowl, a shirt, and a universal top. Okay. If I take this and I get something at a higher level, like maybe she can move to here, and that's what she's got. If I just have her step back, I'm creating shoulder motion, right? I'm giving her control. And this is what I did with your guy from the heart from the heart side. Oh. I didn't do passive range of motion initially. He was guarding. He was not comfortable giving him my arm. I did this. And then once he gets this good, I can take a step back. Right? I can take a step back and get shoulder motion. I can take a step way back when I get better. And your patients can do this at home. I can go side to side, right? I can do, someone just asked me about horizontal abduction and adduction, right? I can do abduction. If I go too far, I want the thumb up so I don't create impingement, right? I give my control to my patient, let them push their own arm with that kind of patient. All right, I can do scapular stuff and do all that stuff. Think she'll be able to do pendulum very well? No, no. Okay, is this helpful? All right, last patient, 83-year-old female who comes to the clinic with diagnosis of shoulder pain, eval, treat, strengthening, range of motion, stretch, home exercise programs, because the doctor doesn't know what to do, they tell you to do everything, right? Um, two times the work for four weeks. The patient reports that she is retired, spends most of her time at the casino. This is actually my mother-in-law, playing the slots. <laughs> she complains of pain in the interior aspect of her shoulder. She has pain with all ADL and home management tasks. And she's a two-pack-a-day smoker, poor posture. You sort of Arthritis. Could be arthritis because she's 83. And then right. we looked at different um, injuries to the joint, but it didn't actually get any indication of that. Right. So looking at the horse for one of these is biceps tendonitis, and she's doing a lot of this. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I was thinking when I wrote the <laughs> Because think of what she's doing at the casino. I mean, either the handle or the button. The button, right? How do we sit in a casino? I don't go to casinos, but how do we sit in a casino? You're on a stool without a back, right? Hunched over, crossing your legs, right? Poor posture. You're creating pathology for it, for her biceps. And she's a two pack a day smoker. Lots of puffing, right? 83, poor circulation. Also because she's a smoker for circulation. And do you think she's got a lot of activity in her life if she's smoking and gambling the whole of the time? Think she does a lot of cardio? <laughs> no, she's at valet because she goes there every day. So she's got the valet parking. And okay, so I'm going to palpate her biceps tendon, right? And then if there's pathology here, there's a problem in the back. Yeah. So address that. So we're gonna want to rest the tendon, work on healing, and then strengthening. Absolutely. Rest the bicep tendon, strengthen the back. We don't do anything back here, right? Just the yoga pose, whatever that's called. 
for you, Liv, when you're prone. Oh, isn't that like the... I don't know all the names of the poses as I go, but I don't remember the names. All right. Any questions about these? You good? Okay. I know I'm like fast and furious, but we got to keep going because we still have a lot of content. So. Are you guys okay with moving forward with shoulders or any with fractures? Okay. We'll just go to 11.30 and we'll stop. About next time. So with this, we're going to move distal down the extremity and cover the rest of the hand, okay? We already talked about this. I knew I had a picture somewhere in this class of this. What do we see here? Pediatric hand. A pediatric hand, right? And why do we know it's a pediatric hand? He's missing carpal bones. He's missing some carpal bones, right? <laughs> and how old is, do we think this kiddo is? Three. 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 Yeah. And what else do we note about the location of the growth plates? Remember, the growth plates are proximal in some areas and distal in others, right? Can we do ultrasound over a growth plate? No. No. Contraindication. And then just so you see, there's a pilon fracture of the distal femur of the thumb and the index finger. Must have gotten crushed during a pinching activity or something. Or stepped on, something like that. What's that? Slam with the car door. Slam with the car door or any kind of door. You know, all kinds of things. Okay. So, in looking at digit fractures, these are the occurrence of fractures. So you can see, most commonly, distal phalanx fractures, and then also metacarpal fractures. And if you fracture the ring and small finger metacarpal, that's called a boxer's fracture, because most commonly occurs from a punch. And the doctor that I used to work with said it was like 99 0.9% occurrence of a boy punching something because of a girl, something like that, because they get mad and they punch something. Boxers fracture. Metacarpal fracture of the women's small um, And then less common would be fractures to the proximal phalanx and the middle phalanx, and we'll talk about that. Um, and <laughs> There's also a chart in your book, um, I don't think the page number is correct, but it's, they have timelines on healing of all the different fractures. So if you have to, ever have to question or look up how long it takes for a fracture to heal, that's a nice um, table in your book. So distal phalanx fractures could be either a tough fracture in the shaft or articular. Have we talked about that an articular fracture means that it crosses the joint space? So when a fracture says it's an articular fracture, that's more complicated because it can affect the joint alignment and the joint congruity, which if it's not aligned appropriately, could limit range of motion, could cause problems with arthritis later on development. So um, lots of problems. Um, also, a lot of our tendons attach near the joint, so if it's an articular fracture, we might have a problem with tendon. So if I have a distal phalanx fracture that's articular with tendon avulsion, what do I get? Malic finger. And if the bone comes off with it, it's called a bony mallet. Bony mallet. Um, Tuft fractures um, are what was on that. Here's a here's just a picture of different fractures. This would be a tuft fracture, um, the distal aspect of the distal phalanx, um, and then you could have a mid shaft fracture, which could be transverse. You could have a horizontal. I mean, op opposite opposite what I just said. Um, and then this is also a picture of a tuft fracture kind of hard to see. My daughter had a top fracture. She was sitting, you know, crisscross applesauce with her hands back and another kid stepped on her hand. Top fracture. Um, but if you look, these heal pretty quickly, right? You put them in a splint, which would be this type of splint. 
for three weeks. By then they should be less painful, and then you should usually be able to take the splint off. If it's really super painful still, I need to leave it back on for another week when the doctor makes that call. Um, but usually they heal really easily. It's a good fracture to have, good outcome. Doesn't affect tendon or motion usually. You splint it for a little bit of a time, and you're fine. My daughter was fine, splint for three weeks. Um, one thing that happens though, when you look at these tuft fractures, frequently involves the nail bed because they frequently happen from a crush, like in the door, the car, closet doors, and a lot of times in kids because I don't know if you're around kids a lot, but kids are always like hiding from each other and jumping out and scaring and slamming them and, and or locking them out of their bedroom, don't come in here, right? And the kids put their hands up to block the door and slams their finger in the door. Lots of kids with injuries. I've had kids on those rocky things at the park, those little horsey things that rock and they put their fingers in the spiral springy thing. Yeah, so they frequently have a nail bed injury that might be open with a wound, okay? So what are you thinking about if they have this nail bed injury with a wound, so they're covered with some kind of gauze, right? And you make this splint over top of it, what's gonna happen? This is going to stick to the gauze. And I've had so many students do this. So don't do it. Your patient will hate you because their finger is on fire, okay? They stuck it in that springy thing, right? It's got a nail bed injury, fracture tip, one of the most sensitive areas in the body, right? Gauze on it, and you, the doctor says, put them in a digit protector splint. You make this, looks beautiful, stuck to the gauze. Can't get it off. And you're pulling on it. It's all covered, right? Very unhappy patient. How can I keep that splint from sticking to the gauze when I make it? Vaseline over it. What else? Wet paper towel. Do something. Put that in your notes because if you have to make this splint, and it's very painful for patients, don't put the splinting material directly on the gauze. If you have to do something else, like say they had a distal radius fracture and they had a gauze wrap on, they were all covered, they had their sutures taken out or something was going on. And if you make the splint over that, you can even just take a stockinette and then you can just cut it off and pull it off. There's lots of things you can do. But on these little finger things, it's stuck on there. And it's very painful to help to get it off. If there is a wound though, would it like the wetness of the paper towel effect? You're not going to leave it on there. Okay. You're going to make the splint, take it off, take oh, the okay. towel off, and then put the splint on. And I'm not talking soaking wet. Like squeeze all the liquid out, just wet enough so that it won't stick. Oh, so the gauze only sticks when you're actually making the splint and not? Only when you're making the splint. Only when you're making the splint. When it's, when it's cool, it's not going to stick to anything. So you don't put it on repeatedly. Only when you're fabricating the splint. Then take it off, take wet paper towel off. If you put petroleum jelly or lotion on the gauze, you have to redo the outside layer. And you have to do it the same. If you make it now much bigger, your splint won't fit on. Right? If you make it too less, it will be too wiggly, it won't support the fracture. So it's got to be the same number of layers. Okay. So the shaft fracture can be either long, longitudinal or transverse, as in the picture. And then we talked about articular fractures where it may create a mallet finger, which you're then adjusting or dealing with two things. Um, middle phalanx fractures are less common. The middle phalanx is a strong, short, squatty bone. So you're most likely to, when if you fall or get injured with something, you're more likely to damage the soft tissue before the bone will break. <laughs> okay? Um, you could either have a fracture that's transverse, oblique, on an angle, or intra-articular. And what does that mean? Involves the joint space. Okay? 
could be closed, non-displaced. They might just buddy tape it to the finger next to it. Get back in the game and play, right? Um, or they might have to have open reduction, internal fixation with plates. Um, something else is people get um, unclear about all the, do we talk about the fixation, about plates usually stay in? Pins are not threaded, so they usually come out. Did we talk about this already? Mm -hmm. So plates and screws normally stay in with internal fixation. Pins are usually temporary because they're not threaded. They won't stay in. They're just temporarily there to, to secure a, a bone fragment or something, and then later they're taken out. Okay? Um, with these patients, we want to put them in an intrinsic plus. Can anyone show me what an intrinsic plus position is? Yep. Intrinsic minus. Right, intrinsic plus um, position because this actually uses soft tissue tissue to help stabilize fractures, and we don't want to we want them to be in a full PIP extension because we don't want to get a, a contracture. Another thing is the P these fractures. I hate these fractures. They're really hard to treat um, because you know if you had enough force to break the bone, it was a high energy injury. And the PIP has the largest arc of motion. So if you take your DIP joint and see how much the norms are, right? And then your PIP, if I just move it in isolation, it has a huge arc of motion as compared to the other joints in the finger. So it can cause a lot of loss of function with being able to hold small objects in your hand and that type of thing. They have to get moving right away, right? Big, in capital letters, stiffness if you have to immobilize for greater than three weeks. Um, they're more likely to have soft tissue injury, right? What would be a soft tissue injury that would occur at the PIP joint? Central slip. Central slip. How long do you have to immobilize the central slip? Six weeks. Six weeks. And what do we know about stiffness? So how easy, and the PIP has the largest arc of motion, how easy is it going to be to get that PIP back to normal? Not easy. Not easy. So I hate treating fracture with central slip injury. They're a nightmare, nightmare. Do you assume that if they have this fracture, they have central slip? No, 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 you can't assume that. So do they get like an MRI or a CT that shows No, nope, the doctor will just assess it and look for active PIP extension. Isolated active PIP extension. If they can extend well, manual muscle test it, right? Even if it's broken? If it, it depends on what's happening with the fracture. The doctor does this. We don't assess for um, PIP. Now, if they had a middle phalanx fracture and they saw a general orthopedic, do you think for sure they would pick up if the central slip was intact or not? No. So you already got the case that all hand patients, in my mind, should be treated by a hand surgeon. Right? How critical. So you see how many opportunities for mistreatment there are, right? Okay, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about for today. And this is a big thing, okay? This is the big, this will be on the test for sure, okay? Because I had a situation where someone was treated inappropriately. So that's for sure the big things, right? When, because there's so much Soft tissue disruption with PIP injuries is more likely, right? So it's more likely that the PIP is going to dislocate before even. You might have a fracture with it, but it's very common to get PIP dislocations. Okay? The difference is 
is that how you describe the dislocation is not the surface where the injury occurred, but it's where P2 moves in relationship to P1. P2 is the middle phalanx, P1 is the proximal phalanx, right? So when you think dorsal dislocation, you think, oh, the injury happened here. That is not where the injury happened. The injury is the volar plate, which is a soft tissue structure which keeps the finger from hyperextending too much. Volar plate. So the injury occurs volar, but the dislocation describes how P2 moves in relationship to P1. Okay? If you have a volar dislocation, it's a central slip injury because, again, it describes P2 in relationship to P1. They move against each other. Okay? So when P2 moves volarly, that, if P2 drops down volarly, that creates the avulsion of the central slip off. Do you see what I'm saying? Central slip injury. Do you think you would treat these two things the same? Do you think you would treat them the opposite? So if you're not clear, will you do the right thing? No. You could really muck someone up. So I had a therapist, she had like six or seven years of experience and I was mentoring her in the clinic. Different location. She calls me and she says, and I can't now remember which one it was, because it was a long time ago. But she said, I have a, I think it was this one. I think, she said, I have a volar dislocation um, with fracture, okay? And, um, and so she's like, I don't know what to do. What do I do? So I told her, that's a central slip injury. We have to hold it in full extension for six to eight to ten weeks, right? You have to splint them with the PIP in full extension, right? She didn't believe me. She's like, Volar? That doesn't make any sense. That's a central slip injury. She splinted them as if it were a volar plate injury with the PIP in partial flexion. Will the central slip ever heal? No. Guess how long, this, case, this is the workman's compensation case. Guess how long it took me to figure out that she, that she splinted them incorrectly. Um, months, because it wasn't until she went on vacation that I went to the clinic and I covered her caseload for her, and I see this guy, and I look at the chart, and I see what she did, and she didn't do what I told her to do. She did the opposite, the wrong thing, right? So, never is going to get his finger straight. What's he going to develop? Boutonniere. Boutonniere deformity. And guess what else? Went to high school with him. Oh. Well, it's not your name that's on it. I know, but this just drives me crazy. Yeah, it drives me crazy. So, there's more stories to tell. <laughs> okay, so here is the picture, but I want to make sure you're, you're clear. Okay? Volar and dorsal dislocation is describing how P2 moves in relationship to P1, not the location of the injury. It's actually the opposite. So with a dorsal dislocation, you have a volar plate injury. Because you can see how this plunges through the volar plate, right? With a Volar dislocation, this plunges up in relationship P2 and P1 and pulls off the central slip. It makes sense, right? But when, you, when you're not educated in what it really is, you hear volar, you think, oh, they disrupted the volar plate. It's actually a central slip injury. So I didn't name them, right? I think I maybe would have named them the opposite way to be more clear, right? Yeah. But, so you have to know that.
Any questions about this location? So with the with the with a dorsal dislocation and a volar plate injury, you splint them in slight flexion so they don't re-dislocate. Just like if you have a labrum tear, you don't move them into external rotation and abduction. You don't want them to re-dislocate. That's why you hold them in slight flexion, not for a long time, because if you immobilize it longer than three weeks, big stiffness, right? And I might put them in 30 degrees of flexion and then increase them to 20, increase to 10, and the next week all the way straight. With the doctor's permission. And then the goal is that extension is? Central slip injury, so it has to be treated in full extension for at least six weeks. And they're going to have big time stiffness. Yeah. Okay. We have five more minutes. Let's keep going. I lied. Okay. That wasn't the last thing we talked about. Let's just talk about metacarpal fractures. Um, I'm sorry. Proximal phalanx fractures, not metacarpal fractures. I have both slides showing up on my thing. Um, the problem with the P1 fracture, and we talked about this when we talked about extensor tendon lacerations, that where P1 is, so large, um, the, the, the extensor tendon lies right, there's a lot of tendon to bone interface. The, the tendon lies right on the bone, so when you break the bone, scar forms, extrinsic healing occurs, latches on the tendon, and you get a tendon gliding issue very frequently with these fractures, okay? Usually you split in the intrinsic plus position, and that is because the sagittal bands help to stabilize the fracture for P1 fractures and for metacarpal fractures. We split in an intrinsic plus position. And, um, and then once you're allowed to, sometimes they'll let you, depending on where the fracture is, is it displaced, what's happening, they might have you put them in an, in an MP block splint and let you do PIP motion, which you would want to do as early as you can because of the scar adhesion issue, right? Active motion will decrease the scar adhesion. All right, let's just talk about metacarpal fractures, and then we will save the elbow and wrist for next week. We already talked about boxer's fracture, is a fracture of the metacarpal of the ring and small. Um, metacarpal fractures heal quick, three to four weeks most of the times. Um, and they, they, they have a lot of um, their, what do I want to say? They leave room for, um, not a good fixation or not a good alignment and they still do pretty darn well, okay? Um, usually they're splinted intrinsic plus, same reason, those whole sagittal bands. A lot of times they're, they're not operated on because again they heal very well if it's not the perfect alignment. So if you have someone that has a metacarpal fracture, sometimes they'll make a fist and they'll say, ah, oh, I don't have my knuckle anymore on this side. And that's because it doesn't have the best alignment but still, usually they're okay and they can do very, very well. So if you know anyone that has a metacarpal fracture, have them make a fist and look to see if you can see all the prominent metacarpal heads. Because you may not be able to see them because of angulation of the bone. If you fracture the metacarpal of the thumb, we have to be concerned about a ligament injury. Remember we talked about the ulnar collateral ligament when we talked about arthritis? That can happen with a fracture to the metacarpal of the thumb. So we want to be concerned about that. And remember the very first day of class, um, and we talked about all of our fingers, when we move them individually, go to one point. Where do they go? Skateboard. Skateboard. So with metacarpal fractures, when the patient can't move well, this is very commonly that the patient will think the doctor fixed is their fingers crooked. But usually it's not, but it can be, right? So again, I have a story. I had a patient one time that had a metacarpal fracture and she was diagnosed with um, complex regional pain syndrome. 
metacarpal fracture. She was a great patient, though. She had great patient characteristics. She did. She never missed therapy. She did everything I asked. Hard worker, stoic, you know. And um, as we started to get more range of motion, I noted pretty quickly that she was malrotated, which means her fracture healed with the bone rotated slightly. And five degrees of malrotation equals, which is not very much, 1.5 centimeters of overlap when the fingers come down into flexion, which is a huge functional implication and drives people crazy, right? So she had complex regional pain syndrome, so what treatment interventions did I use? Stress loading program, right? Scrub and carry, right? Did that. Did other things in the, in the clinic, active and passive range of motion, gentle passive, because people that have complex regional pain syndrome, you don't want to do too aggressive, right? Um, but she had this overlap, right? She was seen by a general orthopedic for her hand fracture. And, um, and so then she developed the complex regional pain syndrome, and she still had it. And so she wanted to get a second opinion. She initiated it. She was young, um, and she was active, and she, it drove her crazy that her finger overlapped the other finger. And her complex regional pain syndrome, although it was still present, was much better controlled once we worked in therapy. And so she, she asked me for a name of some, someone for a second opinion, and so when people do that, I give them a name, just like if someone were to ask me where to get a good you know, pair of shoes or whatever. You know? So I gave her a name. And she saw the doc, and that was the doc that I was working with, so I was there in the clinic when she came. And the doctor's response to me was, are you crazy? You want me to operate on someone that has complex regional pain syndrome? Um, and so I begged, and he did. And the interesting thing, as soon as he repaired her malrotation, the complex regional pain syndrome went completely away. It's almost like your body knows, like something's not right, right? As soon as he corrected the malrotation, she ended up being full range of motion, no more complex regional pain syndrome. So she did great. Um, but still, this can be a big problem with this malrotation. And then here is a picture of it. Malrotation. I think hers was her right finger. Does that only happen after surgery? She didn't have surgery. She, didn't have surgery. Okay. she was treated conservatively with okay. a cast. It was just allowed to heal, and she should have had surgery, so that it wouldn't have healed in a narrow position. Okay? So we'll end here on fixation terminology and mental power, the wrist, and, um, and the elbow next time.